Welcome, Dr. Mutiat Oladejo, again to the Sankofa Pan African series. Now, let's go to your book, your upcoming book. <laughs> By the way, congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so, the book is entitled Gender Politics and Governance in Africa the known and unknown. Um, and, and in it, um, you, you describe the everyday realities for, of, um, uh, and encounters of women in Africa. So what exactly are the known and unknown? And um, how might they also apply to other segments of uh, society like the youths? Yes, the book is actually an edited work. So I have um, several um, authors who are contributors. In my research um, sojourn, I focus on women and gender studies and um, women's history. I realized that um, scholars that have worked on women's history, especially in Nigeria, like Professor Bolanli Aware, used biography as a tool to unravel the, the power and roles men had in the society of the past. In fact, through some of their works, we were able to realize that several works that had been done by male scholars was uh, male-centric. We used to call it that were male-centric. And then really few, few, few references made to women. Then the question comes, does it mean that when women in Africa, even from the pre-colonial era, does it mean that they don't uh, exist in the society? Even though we use patriarchy as a yardstick to understand how women were even in pre-colonial times, such as we cannot remove the fact that the society is very patriarchal from the pre-colonial era. Patriarchal, because colonialism also reinforced patriarchy, although colonialism brought, a, brought about a kind of, um, it's mixed in the sense that colonialism actually empowered women in some ways, but it actually reinforced patriarchy in some ways. And so, and in the post-colonial era, several neoliberal reforms and uh, economic policies also affect women and affect family system. So the status of women, even in post-colonial times, in the family structures, in the society, is um, negatively affected. Even though there are the positive sides of life, but we cannot remove the fact that the negative sides of it are very important and relevant for discussion. And so as a result of this, I just felt that um, given my experience in um, some consultancy work, we realized that politics is something that almost looks like a taboo for women in Nigeria. And I think in most of the societies in West Africa, it is, <laughs> it is a rarity for you as a woman to actually succeed as a politician or to have interest in politics in the first place because there are several factors that inhibit. So, I mean, this that you know, lack of political mentorship for women, godfatherism. Though, when we say political mentorship, it's also, it also, it's also complex because you realize that even the few women that have access to public positions in Nigeria, they went through the process of getting mentored by Godfather. So when people talk during election time, some politicians from another party, they keep using it as a form of political campaign that um, um, no Godfatherism. But I laugh because I feel that Godfatherism is about mentorship. If you don't have, if you don't know someone that is going to tell you if you walk in that direction, you will not get what you want. Then you will not know how to navigate the Nigerian political party space. And so for that, I could, I, what we now rediscover, especially through the Nigerian Women Trust Fund, is that the, the, the required political mentorship for women is not there. And so that's why several women meet stumbling block. Surely we need to make a distinct, um, a distinction between godfatherism and, and mentorship. To my mind, there are two very different things. Uh, mentorship, um, uh, for me, is a system where someone who has had some experience in a particular field takes it upon themselves to nurture yeah. up and coming. 
so that they too can get to that uh, position, yeah. possibly excel. Yeah. Whereas God, for other reason, is a is a situation where a person who is um, a, a big a big man usually um, a person who has kind of gathered some kind of power and economic uh, wealth, you know, usually not through proper means and as a way of sustaining their interests in politics or in, um, in, in whatever field they set themselves up on. Mm -hmm. Now nurture young people to toe their line so that even when they're not physically in power, they're still controlling things. They're two different things. Yes, I I see I see that point, but I still one, believe one, that one, one, the one, kind of the kind one, of setting one stems from self interest and self propagation, whilst the other can actually be genuinely, you know, uh, and, uh, used to positively raise, you know other people up from what i have seen the reality that is what we can i mean contextualize but the reality in nigeria is i look at all the women who have had the advantage of holding political positions in nigeria i realize that even the ones that are technocrats even the ones that are technocrats they are still entangled in that godfatherism system. Even though they may, they may have some respectability as to the way they emerged. They may, they, may, they may command some respectability, but you still notice that there is still this caucus they must have belonged. Yes. In. They are still there. Yes. And that caucus, if you look at their movements up the ladder, you realize that they have been mentored for some time. We don't know them when they were being mentored. My so problem by the time is they using emerged, the word mentoring for those kind of practices. It's a, what, what they've been, actually been doing has been aligned, you know, to, yeah. to a godfather or some powerful person. It's, it, it, although mentorship also has its own um, shortcomings. Mm. But honestly, Godfatherism is has no, there's nothing positive that can come out of Godfatherism in terms of looking at the societal good. As far as I'm concerned, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's why I'm a okay. bit, so, I mean, um, that's why I'm a bit um, kind of yeah. Uh, yeah skeptical about using the yeah. the word Godfatherism to describe that route that some women wow. are forced to take because of the way politics is structured around mm. money, around ethnicity, around self-interest, yeah. around um, religious um, segregation and all of that. It's, it's, it has not served anybody well. Not the women who have ended up going that way. Some of them have actually had their fingers burnt, you know? And yeah. because of the the numbers that they lack, when they get into the system, they get sucked into all the corruption and all of that because they do not exactly. have political enough mass, you know, to be able to make much difference. Yes, and so that's why I I came up with the idea that we already know some things. And for instance, what we know is that women are women in public positions are also being sexualized. They are seen as some people, some some sort of people who had done some shady things with some of their godfathers, and uh, before they could get to those positions, and uh, those are the ways men perceive some of these things, which is also problematic. Mm. And uh, of course, the unknown is that looking across African societies, you realize that there are several things we don't see that women do that actually is a form of um, and reinforcing power and speaking truth to power to influence things that affect women. And so those are the point, um, the political, the, the things that entangle between politics and uh, governance. And so when I say the unknown, 
I have worked on several things and I realized that uh, looking at um, Ellen John Salif in Liberia, for example, when everything was, I mean, I mean, when Liberia was in a state of turmoil and there was no way out of the anarchical system they find themselves in, Ellen John Salif looked at directions people were, not, the men were not looking at in the society and they started working with women at the grassroots. The women at the grassroots were actually the ones that led the campaign for her to emerge as the president and that actually sustained her through. Then we look at Joyce Mujuru in Zimbabwe, much as she, she, she was also a kind under the influence of Godfather through her political party, but looking at the history of her involvement in politics, she had been involved in Zimbabwean politics since the 1970s. And so she transformed from, from being a military woman, a guerrilla girl to a civilian. And she was part of the political system, not until they realized that she was actually interested in becoming the president. And they started bringing up all sorts of things against her to actually downplay her interest and ambition. Then the third one is one Gary Masai in Kenya. She also actually um, um, lose her marriage because she was interested in activism and all that, speaking truth to power. I think it was in Arab Moy in Kenya then, actually um, um, did a lot of things against her. I think at the point she was imprisoned. But you know, she, she made sure that she used the environment, protecting the environment as a means of activism. So these are several things people tend not to see or understand about the society. So that's what the book is about. Mm. Well, I, the, I, the, I, the, I, I'm sure a lot of people will find um, the, in your work, the fact that you actually take time to, to make these arguments that women have never really been excluded from politics, you know, but that there are certain issues around their involvement. Um, yes. I know that you look at Lagos, which is an urban, uh, urban area, urbanized mm -hmm. part of, uh, of Nigeria, mm -hmm. and um, the way in which certain positions, political positions, have been feminized, you know, in Lagos. Can you throw some more light on? I know you. Um, one of the illustrations, um, some of the illustrations you've given about other women in other African countries show how some of them actually fall prey to this godfatherism. I mean, the mm. Zimbabwean and the uh, Ugandan instance, I mean, these are examples of women who having gone through, risen through the ranks uh, because of influences of some level of godfatherism, at the end of the day, it turns and bites them in the face. Yeah. You know? So you also looked at it in, 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 in in the Nigerian situation. And one of your studies actually looks at Lagos. Can you please throw some more light on the politics in, in yeah. Lagos? So issue of Lagos, Nigeria started democracy in 1999. And I think then Lagos- um, Not started, we resumed <laughs> after a long, we, we resumed after a long, I mean, after yeah, you. yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You know, there is a tendency to always see that 1999 as a new. No, day. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and so, AD then was Alliance for Democracy was the party in power, and um, the the I think it was then Bola Tinubu emerged as the governor of Lagos State, and from what we know or what we can um, decide. It wasn't as if it was his interest to have a female deputy governor in the first instance, but it was the interest of the party. Some other factions in the party felt that that candidate, the woman that was his deputy there, should emerge. And so that was how, so it was a kind of a party ideology, but not the interest of the governor himself. So that brings us to the question of how complicated it is within the Nigerian constitution we at times we ask ourselves what exactly are the roles of the deputy governors in Nigeria? Otedola also had a female deputy, Michael Otedola. I think it was Okunu. Had a number of female deputy governors in Lagos. Yeah, yeah. And so this particular case here for that chapter is a lot of factors. It wasn't the, the governor himself 
wasn't interested in a female deputy, but it was the interest of the party. Meaning that the party ideology felt that at that point in time that there should be gender inclusion, which is good enough. But we realized that the woman who became um, Tinubu's deputy then, they had some disagreements, a fallout, and uh, I think she, she resigned. I think she voluntarily left, even though she must have been pressured, but she, she voluntarily left and um, a male candidate emerged as the, the deputy governor. But subsequently, looking at the history of that position, I think after Femi Pedro, other um, candidates in that position have been female. Um, I think about five or six women have occupied that position, not until 2019, when the dynamics changed again. And of course, the dynamics changed because um, maybe we should say that um, despite the fact that women have occupied this position over the years, there is still this political mentorship for women that is lacking. So the kind of power those women probably command in the caucuses they belong to within the party may not be there presently. So the new women, especially women who are going to be in their middle ages, middle ages maybe from 30 to 45, that age bracket, they still lack mentorship of what it takes to occupy some of these posts. And so they still, women in that age bracket still have a challenge of getting mentored and getting prepared for these uh, positions. Like I said, political party politics for women is complex because this, I, I think in my PhD thesis, um, Ibadan Market Women and Politics, I realized that the way um, political parties have been structured since the era of Awolowo is a bit problematic for women. They call it women's wing. And at times I wonder, I really don't, personally, I don't like that idea because that idea is a way of removing women from important things within the party. So they call it women's wing. They create a kind of executive in that women's wing. And so only that women's wing only becomes relevant when it's time to campaign for elections. So in fact, there was Nigerian Women Trust Fund organized a workshop last year and female politicians were invited to come and talk about their experiences as members of political parties. And it was shocking, their revelations were shocking. They, were, they are just there, just like I discovered in my PhD thesis from the 1950s. Same thing is still repeating itself in contemporary terms. They tell you they don't even have a budget as women's wing of the party. They don't understand how the finances should even go about. So all they know is when it is time for election, the men will just allow, give, some, give them some amount to, to campaign. And so these are the kind of things. So at 2019 in Lagos election, women were not nominated for the post of deputy governor. And I don't know by 2023, if there are women that can continue the struggle and ensure that uh, a female candidate emerges. Of course, there are women who hold the posts of uh, commissioners and all that. So, so if oh, they are figureheads. Yeah. So in other words, I think from what I'm taking away from your explanation is that, so it's not as if um, there are no, no women in, in politics in places like Lagos and uh, other urban areas. They are so. there. They are, they are there, mm. but the route for them getting there is one that has not been beneficial to them. Exactly. And so the kind of mentorship they need should be one which looks critically at the way in which, you know, power devolves in these political parties, you know, yes. and then kind of help women strategize you know, so that they can, you know, um, they can first of all challenge the way it's run and maybe bring in, insist on, you know, doing things properly so that they stop being go ahead. Thank you very much for being a part of uh, the Sankofa Pan African series. If you have not yet subscribed, please do so and don't forget to like and share our videos with your contacts. See you next time.